On today's episode of the podcast, we'll be breaking down the winners, losers, and steals of the 2023 NHL draft, breaking down the teams that did the best job, the teams that did the not so good job, and then who got the highest value out of their picks. All coming up on Locked On NHL Prospects. You are Locked On NHL Prospects, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome back to the Locked On NHL Prospects Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. On this podcast, Sebastian and I break down everything prospects related for you five days a week, Monday to Friday. Uh, no, my name is Hattie Kalakesh. I'm joined by Sebastian. Hi, we're both um, high ranked guys at Dauber Prospects, right? Uh, but we love doing this work here. We'll breaking we'll be breaking down on today's episode the winners and losers in terms of teams of the 2023 NHL draft. And then in our final segment, we'll be breaking down the picks that are that already qualify as steals based on where they were meant to go, where they were ranked on most rankings. So make sure to stick all the way to the end. We'll talk about that all in detail. In the meantime, though, uh, make sure to like and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube and if you're listening on your favorite podcasting platform. Make sure to make us your first listen of the day. It's always very much appreciated. So, Sebastian. Let's get right into it with the winners and losers. We'll start with the winners in our first segment here. Now, there are a lot of teams to talk about here. I think of a lot of teams that really, really good drafts, um, you know, not in terms of landing every pick and nailing every one, but, you know, in some teams that is the case. So let's start with uh, with Columbus here. What do you think about their draft hall so far? I think it was my favorite draft class overall, um, also because of the draft capital that they had. Like, I think yep. maybe Carolina – hit on a larger percentage of picks maybe maybe not but close to it but they just didn't have the same draft capital so the value mm-hmm. they got out of the draft just couldn't compare but mm-hmm. landing adam fantilli gavin brindley william white law andrew strothman luca Pinelli, and tyler Peddle in a single draft class with just one pick in each of the first three rounds is absurd value in my book absolutely yeah i fully agree i especially like the gavin brindley pick in the early second for me this is a pick that First of all, I believe Adam Fantilli said he cried a little bit when Gavin Bridley was Aww. picked, which is adorable. Uh, but their teammates, they've been teammates for a long while, and I think their skill sets really complement each other. If you get them on the top six together, holy, that's going to mm-hmm. be fun. Uh, but yeah, moving on to our second winners of the draft. I'm proud to announce that the Nashville Predators had a good draft, um, courtesy of Barry Trotz. Let's talk about that a little bit. I like the haul here, especially their picks in the first round. Um, Matthew Wood is decent value at 15. It's okay. I like it a lot. It's a big swing on upside. It's a really big swing, and it could pay off massively. Same for Tanner Molendyke, who's probably one of the best rush defenders in the draft. But I'm a bit less enthusiastic on that, a bit more tentative, yeah. because he is an absolutely elite skater, a very good rush defender, and everything else is a work in progress. I... I liked a player like Bo Aki a little bit more personally along mm-hmm. those same lines. But yeah. uh, I think especially if you're taking like the message was to take big swings and they did just that because uh, Tanner Mullen likes to swing for, for the fences. Absolutely. Then you talk about some of their later picks like Kalen Lynn, Felix Nielsen, even Joey Willis in the, in the fourth I round. I like Joey Willis. Fantastic. We love Joey Willis, don't we? Just a fantastic defensive player, but you, you can see the kind of glimpse of offensive game that could be there's, developed. There's some so. nice creativity. Like, like he flashes some really fun things. He's he's really fun. He's not he's not like your boring stay at home defensive forward at all. He's Absolutely. he's creative and and sneaky and really really fun to watch. And I think you quite liked the Aiden Fink pick as well, didn't you? I absolutely loved it. For me, Aiden Fink is one guy who I watched this year with Brooks, and I was like, man, he's at like he he's just not meant to be playing that low level hockey. He he's if he was eligible for the WHL, he would have tore it up. I really think that you know you can look at the skating and the size as a concern. That's definitely why he slipped all the way to 218th in, in that late seventh round. But if you look at the skill set in a vacuum, if you look at the ability to manipulate lanes, to open up passing lanes, to play give and go, to and especially his underrated shot, which I think is one thing that isn't talked about enough is Aiden Fink's a really good goal scorer as well so he's just got a lot to his game that's that's really interesting and I think that definitely once you hit the seventh round and he's still available I would have run to the podium for him I had him 75th so yeah definitely up there for sure so so that's the Nashville Predators now we move on to Chicago it's hard to not pin him as winners having come out of this draft the best player and Connor Bard but I'm more more interested in their second person 
Yeah, exactly. I'm a lot more interested in the second first rounder there and Oliver Moore at 19. Oliver Moore. <laughs> For me, Oliver Great Moore pick. was... At the, you know, in the NTDP, he was competing with Will Smith for me as a top pick. So to I have agree. him have him at 19th, for me, he might be, you know, he's not going to score as many points as Will Smith. Definitely not. But he's going to be more impactful. Exactly. Yeah, maybe. You know, for me, the impact that Offer Moore brings to the game defensively in terms of intensity, in terms of, you know, he's the best skater in the draft. So, And, and I think yeah. the situation for him is absolutely perfect because he will never have to be the 1C. He can just yeah, be... Exactly. You see if he if he continues on his current trajectory, and I love that. Um, I think picking Adam Guyana at thirty five was a bit of a reach. Uh, he was not the goalie I would have picked first in the in the draft class, um, but yeah. I can see why. Look, his World Junior performance was unbelievable. Yep, and he's big and mobile, but thirty five yeah. is rich, a little bit rich. But despite that, I do think that Chicago is a winner in this draft class. Adding guys like Martin Mishiak and Nick Lardis in the late second and early third rounds is awesome value. Uh, yep. I quite like the Marcel Marcel pick. I, I chuckled a bit when he got picked, not just because of the, the name, but he is the most wacky QMJL player there is. He is yep. six foot four, two hundred and forty three pounds. I got to watch him live a couple times in Gatineau uh, and. He, he looks like a man amongst children in the QMJHL. He really does. Really entertaining. I, I don't know what the NHL upside there specifically is, but maybe you get mm-hmm. a massive fourth line checking forward out of it who mm-hmm. entertains people on the ice and with his name. And I think that you can do a lot worse than that combination. Absolutely. Uh, then we got another winner here in Carolina. What a surprise. Uh, Carolina's picks of Russian players overall over the last three or four <laughs> years have been just elite. I mean, you talk about the value they added in the late first with Bradley Nadeau. Already, that's fantastic value in terms of great value. Can bring. Just high-end goal scorer, probably one of the best goal scorers, top three, top five goal scorer in the draft. Getting that at 30 is amazing. Then you look at Felix Ungersorum, which is Our great guy. value at 62. He's just amazing. He's I so was, fun. This was really validating to me because I talked to a lot of other public scouts about FUS and... Very few other public scouts shared our enthusiasm at Dauber for Felix Ungersorum. So yep. seeing him pick top 64 by Carolina of all teams was really validating to me because uh, he was a guy where I, I kept going back and being like, what am I missing here? What What's wrong? Because yeah. I kept talking with other public scouts who were way more tentative and really good public scouts. So I was starting to doubt myself a little bit, but uh, mm-hmm. I think Carolina picking him at 62 was nice and validating. And I'm really happy for him. He's a really really like the style of game he plays is like high intensity, really high engagement. And I like those players getting re- rewarded for their effort. Absolutely. And then for me, probably their best pick of the draft in Jaden Perron at 94th. Yeah. We love Jaden Perron. Um, and the fact that Carolina loves him as well is a great sign for us as scouts. Just he, I have so much trouble naming a weakness of his and it's just, on top of that, he's got some of the best hands in the draft. He's got a lot of offensive acumen and awareness. He's inconsistent at times. Maybe his top speed pace, needs to come up. Pace needs yeah. to work. It, he's not yeah. as inside driven when there's pressure. Like There's definitely areas for improvement, but he's mm-hmm. extremely well-rounded in a really good way. He's a tenacious defensive player. Yep. Getting up 94 is absurd. And there, there were two more picks in that draft class that I quite liked as well. I think mm-hmm. Alexander Rikov at 100 and Timur Mukhanov at 163 are both great value bets. Absolutely. And just to end things up for our winners, we've got the Philadelphia Flyers already just getting Matt Vamichkov in this at seventh overall is just insanity to me. Just so he's probably he's up there with Bedard in terms of upside for me. It, it's just ridiculous. I, I, I don't think he has quite the same the same level of upside as, as Bedard. I was never quite convinced of that, but I think he has the second highest upside in, in the draft class, perhaps slightly edging out Fantilli. And I think people mm-hmm. do undervalue Fantilli's upside. But yeah. I, I do think Mishkov is just a slight bit higher, but the likelihood of where Fantilli becomes the more impactful piece between the two, I think, is enough to sway me to, to pick Fantilli over Mishkov. But oof, mm-hmm. getting Matt Vay Mishkov at seventh overall is absurd, and uh, he will score a lot of goals in the NHL for a very, very long time. Absolutely. And that's not even getting into Jaeger Ye- Zafragan at 87th. Um, you know, guys like Cole Knubel and Alex Chernik in the fourth round. Uh, Carter Southern is a nice pick. Yeah. Got absolutely. a lot they there. A, they got a lot of great value out of the shaft. Uh, Denver Barkey as well. Oh, that's <laughs> your right. Boy. Can't forget your boy Barkey here. As well. 
Fantastic. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, quick honorable mention to Seattle, San Jose, and Buffalo. All three of them had fantastic drafts. We just didn't have time to plug them in. But yeah, a lot of winners in this draft. Now let's get into the losers. Unfortunately, our second segment is going to be a bit more pessimistic, but we'll get right into it right after these messages. Our next partner is AG1, the daily foundation nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I gave AG1 a try. And now every morning before I drink my cup of coffee, when I'm out perched on my front porch, I also take some AG1 and it really helps me feel energized and ready to take on the next day. I'm always after some new ways of healthily gaining some more energy and AG1 works pretty well for me. If a comprehensive solution is what you are after, then try AG1 and get a free one year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first port purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash NHL network to check it out. That is drinkag1 slash NHL network. Go check it out. All right. So moving on to our pessimistic portion of the episode, we'll talk about the losers of this draft, the teams that didn't do as well with the picks that they had, uh, or just overall didn't do a good job of managing their picks uh, in, in general. So let's start with, for me, the, the main kind of headlining kind of not so good drafting team of this of this class, which is Montreal. I mean, the Canadians had heading into the draft, you know, heading heading into the postseason, they had uh, picks five, 31 and 37. They traded picks 31 and 37 for Alex Newhook. Time will tell whether or not that's a good trade. I don't think so, based on the the players that might have been available in that range. But I love I love Newhook. I think acquiring him is an awesome thing the Habs did. I think they yeah. paid too much to do so. Absolutely. But focusing on the picks they had. Uh, at fifth overall, David Reinbacher was not my guy. Straight, just, straight up, I just, I like what he brings to the game. I like the certainty of his profile. I think he's going to be a fantastic second pair defenseman. Yeah. For me, I don't think he can, and I don't think he will become anything more than that. But time will tell. With scouting, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Players develop some skills out of nowhere sometimes that you're not expecting. So we'll see about that. I just, from everything I've seen, everything I've read, everything I've heard, Reinbacher wasn't exceptional in interviews to the point where he would be one of the guys that's considered in the top five just based on character. He's got an average skill set, really not a good handler, but just a fantastic yeah. defensive defenseman. He's a, he's a very he's very good in his own zone, and yeah. there's been there's been moments this season where I see an offensive willingness in him, where he activates and he'll circle around the offensive zone, but mm -hmm. he really struggled to pierce a, like compact NL defensive structures. So he would yeah. literally circle the offensive zone in possession of the puck, searching for openings, but he wouldn't include delays. He wouldn't try to deceive to to create those openings. So mm -hmm. I don't think he, he he at least doesn't yet have the tools to be offensively creative, but he mm -hmm. has the passing mecha mechanics to, if he adds some creativity and some dynamism and deception into his movements, which we've seen the Habs development staff be able to help players build those skills. Mm -hmm. If they can, I think you'll unlock a higher upside with him where you have some offensive creativity. And if you can get those offensive activations to actually create offensive chances, Mm -hmm. you're, I'm starting to see a more interesting player there. Like in transition, yeah. he's mainly just a passer. As you said, the handling is a bit of an issue. He's a locked top hand. Uh, but defensively, really, really strong. And the Habs needed right D. I can see how they kind of pit and hold themselves into selecting for position. I just, with Matt Van Mishkov on the board and Zach Benson on the board, it's tough for me to rationalize. Yeah. At the same time, I think he's going to be an excellent top four piece for a very long time. I just think that they, they that the asset they gave up to acquire that that valuable piece doesn't quite correlate with that value at least at this point in time. No, hundred uh, percent. You know, starting at ten, sure. At five, yeah. you had so much value on the board. It's just, and especially the fact that their their second pick. I mean, I I love Jacob Fowler. I think he's a fantastic pick at uh, 69th overall. For me, their third pick being at 101st already as a bottom five team. I agree. Bad. I agree. And on top of that, having that pick be Florian Jacki, who probably wasn't going to get drafted this year, or if he was going to get drafted, was probably going to be available in the sixth or seventh round. Yeah. I cannot justify that being a good pick. It's a lot of draft capital to spend on a player player who has yet to go half a point a game in the OHL, I believe. There's a lot of question marks. And I think for me, kind of something that concerns me is I, I feel like I had a pretty good overview of the draft class. And mm -hmm. prior to this draft, I had scouted Reinbacher, Fowler, Florian Jacki, and Luke Middlestadt. And that was it. And yeah. there's a lot of swings where, at least in terms of public radar, it was off the board. 
I'm mm-hmm. sure some of them were a bit more on the board in terms of, of private uh, rankings, but a guy like Sam Harris at, in the fifth round, I I, I struggle with that. Uh, mm-hmm. I think as a whole, all these picks are things where like I, as someone who still does like the Habs, lots of a Habs fan than I used to be, but I I hope they make us look dumb for criticizing yeah. the, the class, but I have so many question marks here and uh, would have also loved if the interviews with team staff would have actually gone a bit more into depth as to why they picked these players and why their yeah. toolkits are enticing. Because a lot of it kind of just boiled down to they were highest on our board and they're good character. And that was kind of it. Of I think some transparency in terms of the reasoning for draft picks would also gain a lot of trust from scouts and fans alike in terms of like, please explain to me why you're picking these players. I'd love to hear it, but I didn't yeah. really get those explanations that would have maybe convinced me otherwise. Makes sense. And then moving on to Vancouver. Now, Vancouver had, you know, in terms of the picks they had, I I just, there's a lot of value left on the board, especially Tom Villander at 11th. I think that with Zach Benson still there, he seemed like a great fit. He's a local guy. Just yeah. it, it just seemed like something that they would do, but they went with the defenseman. I understand it. They have a need for that, but then after that, they just kept going with Demon. I mean, for me, um, you know, Hunter Bustavis is good value for sure. Yeah. But after that, just, I mean. So it's your just Minio a, top 100 is a bit much for me. I did not see him getting picked at all, let alone yeah. in the top 100. So that's one weird one. Uh, then you go into Ty Mueller, who really was off the board as well. Uh, Bill Ulrichson as well. Matthew Perkins a lot was of fine, question marks. but a lot of question marks in terms of their picks. But then we can uh, just kind of talk about the Islanders and the lack of first round pick. Their last first round pick was in 2019. Like, what's going Which on with the It's not yeah. ideal at all for a team that's middling, um, and especially having their first, you know, their first couple of picks be so safe in terms of Danny Nelson, uh, you know, uh, Jesse Normie, those kinds of guys. I think that the Islanders could have done a lot better with the picks that they had, but they kind of went for the safe picks because they wanted any shellers, which, you know... I don't know if they... Team... Like, D- Danny Nelson, to me, is a high likelihood of 4C, and I don't know if there's anything beyond that. And I think yeah. spending a second-round pick on that asset is a bit steep for me. Yeah. Um, but, like, Pittsburgh is another team where they took some swings that... I, I wouldn't have personally t- taken like Braden Yeager at 14th overall to me is a That's high. bit much. Yeah. He, he, it's not that he just didn't progress in the last year. Like I, I thought he was a better player as a DMS in his DMS one season than he was last year. So yeah, that scares me. Like there's not just a, like, a lack of progression, but there's kind of a regression in a, in your draft mm-hmm. year season that puts up some, some, some warning bells in my mind. Uh, I think Cooper Foster at 174 is a perfectly fine pick. Same with Emilia yeah. Ventia at, at, two, at 217. But I think mm-hmm. as a whole, there's a lot of these picks that for Pittsburgh that I wouldn't have personally made. And I, I struggle to, to fully rationalize it. Like even Emil Pianiemi at the top 100, it was a bit much for me. I I, I didn't mind him in my viewings, but it was kind, it was kind of more in that glut of, of HMs for me of just guys where it's like had some nice flashes but there wasn't that consistent ability and or, or game breaking flashes even uh that that would entice me to spend a top 100 pick on them uh For but sure. yeah and then the last one with auto i think ottawa was one more that we had as as a a bit of a question mark uh in their draft class and they, they had no top 100 yeah. pick so it's tougher to criticize the selections themselves yeah. i think hoyt stanley at 108 is fine He's really raw. It's a big swing. I don't mind that. It's a bit higher than I'd feel comfortable taking it, but that's okay. But I'm not convinced they added a single other intriguing prospect with their other four selections from what I've seen. I haven't watched Vladimir Nikita much at all, so I'm going to refrain on that. But mm-hmm. Andonovsky, Beckner, and Van Tassel are all bottom half of the lineup like junior players that I wouldn't have uh, selected in the NHL draft class, but uh, what's your take yeah. on this class here? I think Andonovsky's fine, but other than that, I don't think the the Senators really added much of value. But yeah, no, I mean, this kind of there's a, there's a couple other teams we could have considered, but just a lack of high high end picks in the top 100 yeah. kind of put them out of there. That's why we were kind of on the fence regarding Ottawa, because it's, it's not really fair to kind of compare them to teams that had multiple first rounders yeah, and multiple picks the in the top 100. Uh, so yeah, no, uh, but but that's it for our second segment regarding the losers of the draft. Now we're going to go into the uh, picks that we can already qualify as steals based on where they were supposed to go. We'll get into it right after these messages. All right, so for our final segments, we'll look into the early steals of this draft. Now, if you want in-depth reports, we're going to go pretty quickly here, but if you want the in-depth kind of analysis of 
pretty much every single team's draft haul. You can look at our first four episodes of the week. We get into every team of the NHL's draft haul and what they got out of their players based on what we've watched. But let's start off with, for me, the kind of more evident one in Matt Mishkov is seventh overall to the Philadelphia Flyers. The Russian factor definitely played into it. There were some character concerns as well um, and just a lot of uncertainty surrounding him. But He's just fantastic in terms of the upside, the goal scoring ability. I don't think there's a better player. I mean, I mean, six foot or six feet around the net in terms of you know plugging pucks into the back of the net. I don't think there's a better player than Mitchov in this draft. I think yeah, Bedard that, is, but that's yeah. not exceptional. And and that's it's the Bedard exception. It barely counts. Like, he's just he's just good he's at great. everything. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you add on top of that the playmaking improvements. You add on top of that the sick handling ability, the sick sense that he has for danger in the offensive zone. Very There's impressive. just so much I like about Mishkov. He was my my third ranked prospect. So Mine that's, too. that's that's that says enough about what I think about him. Uh, uh, yeah, Zach Benson. Yeah. Zach Benson, another one, right? Like we're we're massive Zach Benson fans. Uh, he ended up falling in the draft because. Of his combination of lack of height and uh, he's not an above average skater. He's kind of like average, maybe sli- a tinge below average skating. But in my in, in my view, and I think you share this, Hattie, he doesn't need to be that. And and he's so intelligent, so skilled. One of the the top two or three playmakers in the entire draft class, along with 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 uh, Connor Bedard and Will Smith, probably uh, just tremendous. He's an elite defensive forward an elite four checker, an elite motor. He has everything they could possibly want in a player except for size and speed, basically. But he doesn't need to because he thinks the game at a level so much higher than everyone he plays against. And every single shift he played with Winnipeg this season, his line was the best one. So uh, that's a profile that I would swing on and Buffalo game at 13 was disgustingly good value. So absurd. Yeah. Speaking of uh, of high-end defensive players who went lower than they should have, Oliver Moore at 19th. Um, yeah. The fastest skater in the draft, the best skater overall in the draft, on top of that being one of the more intense players in the draft, on top of that being one of the most defensively responsible, and on top of that having decent skills, I think he slipped mainly because of teams kind of being concerned by the speed being too much for his own hands. The more the year went on, the less I was concerned with that, and that's why he was kind of neck and neck with Will Smith for me at the top end of my top 10. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think that teams looked at more, especially early in the year and saw a player that was playing too fast for his own good. Uh, but I think that as years, as the year goes on, we'll see a lot less of concern on that end. Uh, but yeah, tell us about Musty. Yeah. Quentin Musty is, I think an awesome, awesome pick for San Jose at 26. You're getting a player with like probably a top five or six upside in the entire draft class. He's mm-hmm. really raw. He ne- you'll need some time to refine, but, uh, there's a, there's definitely a scenario where he becomes a pretty pretty dominant top line power winger and he blends that power game with elite handling skill and uh he is a really good goal scorer and he's an elite playmaker uh yes the defensive engagement isn't great yet and he's still in the process of learning how to use his line mates which must have uh also contributed to him falling in the draft but uh there is such tremendous upside here that I love that dra- that draft selection it's here. It's insane for value sure. for for San Jose for sure. Uh, then we got Gavin Brindley at thirty four to Columbus, just a probably the best rush defending forward in this draft. Oh, it's yeah. just it's, it's a very particular pockets. skill. He's really good at it. Um, but on top of that, as the year went on in Michigan and injuries kind of. Um, plagued their lineup. He made his way up into the top six and showed that he has a playmaking ability, the off-puck smarts, the movement in the offensive zone to make it work offensively as well. For me, he was a lock for my top 15, and to have him available at 34 is just fantastic value. Another small, undersized forward who mainly slipped because of the lack of size. Um, I don't see anything outside of that that would concern an NHL team because everything else he does really, really well, especially off the puck. Yeah, I think Andrew Crystal is another player where we weren't at all surprised he fell outside the first round. Yeah. Uh, and I I know that very few NHL teams had him even on the brink of the first round in terms of value because mm-hmm. uh, he's scary. He has he has the biggest uh, divergence between his, his hills and valleys in terms of the highs and lows in his game uh, of any player in this draft class. And that understandably scares teams off. He's in, incredibly inconsistent, but he has game-breaking ability. And I think with a second-round draft pick, if you swing and miss on a player who could be a middle six player, that stings a bit. But if you swing and miss on a guy that could be a top liner with a second round yeah. draft pick, especially when, when they when Washington already landed Ryan Leonard in the first round, they mm-hmm. had the freedom to take that swing, and I'm very glad they did. 
Absolutely. And then we got Oscar Fisker Molgard at 52. Um, just one of the more refined and mature players in this draft. Um, you know, Sebastian referred to him in last episode as this year is kind of uh, Arturi Lekin. And I think that's a fantastic comparison in terms of what he does right. Um, but kind of a more playmaking and less goal scoring Arturi Lekin. Yes. I like a shot. I, I especially like the clutch ability. He's so clutch in moments where he's needed by his team. Um, but really what you're getting out of him is a very mature, very refined, very uh, impactful and and reliable player in, in Oscar for Samuel Garden. Get that in the in the mid to late second round. Fantastic value. Um, I think the lack of flash and, and high-end offensive abilities kind of kept him out of first round conversation, but I felt like he was just a, a pure contender's pick, and I, I expected him to be one of the guys, you know, between him, David Edstrom, Fer Felix Nielsen, one of those Swedish guys, I felt like one of them was going to get picked in the late first round. Vegas ended up going for David Estrom, but for me, Oscar Fisker Mollard is a better version of Estrom. So I'm surprised to see him available this far. I agree. And then we had the two picks at 63 and 64, uh, which were both excellent Grayson Souchin and Riley Height, two mm -hmm. undersized but hyper skilled WHLers that we like a lot for different reasons, but they are both very intense. And uh, where Grayson Souchin has one of the best handling skills in the entire draft class and is also a really high end playmaker. Height kind of matches that, but in a, in a way where his goal scoring is a big question mark for me. And yeah. I, I think in the end, I had Session ranked a little bit higher than Height because of his ability to also score, and he's more of a dual threat offensively. And I mm -hmm. like his defensive game a little bit more than Height's, but I know that, that, that you are one of the, the highest people on Height in the public sphere. So yeah. tell me about why you like Riley Height specifically. I like Riley Height because he dictates the game off the puck so well. I mean, he he, he plays kind of a shepherd role when, when facing defensemen that are trying to break out. He'll angle them towards... Uh, you know, defensemen on his side or, or his wingers on his side regarding where he wants them to go. He kind of mind tricks them into going into lanes that they don't want to in order to face pressure that they weren't expecting. And he he doesn't generate turnovers himself, but he creates them off his teammates' stick just by his positioning and his angling of players. So that's one thing he does extremely well, especially like the feistiness with height. You see him often, you know, throw a punch after the whistle, a little a little tug and shove, you know, that kind of stuff. He's really involved between whistles, which is always very fun to watch. But I especially think that the playmaking is going to develop into something that's kind of a, a second line potential type thing. I see him as kind of a uh, kind of a um Yanni Gord with better playmaking is how I, is how I consider him. So I think, I I think your, your read on height is basically exactly my read on Souchin. So <laughs> there we go. I think that covers both of them. Uh, Absolutely. But another another WHL steal, but now in the third round, Caden Price at 84th overall is fantastic yeah. value for Seattle. And uh, we talked about this on yesterday's episode. And yeah, it's a, it's a really fun pick because he's really raw. He's one of the most inconsistent defensemen in the entire draft class. Kelowna kind of had a thing of that, like with, with Price and Crystal, but uh, he's also really young for the class. He's a long runway and he has a combination of mobility and reach and transition defending and passing ability and handling flashes. And if he can put it all together, I think you get a really special player. It's not overly likely that, that he will, but spending a, a third round draft pick on that risk, I think is a, a very, very nice value selection. Absolutely. And then you got Jaden Perron at 94. We, we all know how Probably we feel about Probably the best pick Perron. in the draft. I mean, apart for from me, Mitch Comet 7, I think yeah, apart from no. that, I think this is the best pick. Perron is good in, in quite a few different areas. He's really versatile. He's really fun. Uh, but he fell because his production wasn't great in the USHL. And uh, in the USHL, uh, Jaden Perron has may not produce the highest degree, but he's been showing elite level off, off puck offensive movement. And uh, I think he's a very special player. So for Carolina to nab that at 94th overall, I think is a tremendous swing on upside. Uh, but yeah, it's it, it definitely a very fun pick. And beyond that, a player that I was really surprised fell outside the top 100 was Cameron Allen at 136, uh, where I wasn't expecting him to fall that far, but uh, he did. And I think it was a bit of an overcorrection in terms of, how NHL scouts viewed him. Like he definitely fell because of concerns around his decision-making, especially in terms of his shooting habits and on puck decisions uh, under pressure specifically. He could panic a little bit under pressure. However, you're getting a player who's shown some really intriguing defensive feistiness and he's very mobile. Mobile. He's a, he's, I think he could become a really intriguing transit offensive transition piece as well. He just, he cannot be 
the offensive blue line on a pairing because he he struggled in that role and that's what Guelph kind of pigeonholed him as and he struggled a lot as a result but I don't think he deserved to fall to 134 136 where he ended up going uh so that's another one where I think that the team got fantastic value uh moving on we have another OHL defender who went 14 picks later Matthew Mania at 150 to LA uh who is a chaotic defenseman but in flashes has gone end to end showing tremendous skill. He's really poised under pressure, loves to draw it in in order to exploit open space and to help his teammates uh, access it as well. Uh, defensively a bit chaotic. He'll need to tame that and he will need four to five years to progress enough to get to an NHL level. But I think it's possible and getting that at 150 is awesome. Uh, and the last three picks I want to give a shout out at, uh, Shout out four towards the end of the draft class are Timur Mukhanov to Carolina at 163, Aiden Fink at 218 in Nashville, and Tyler Peddle at 224, the final pick of the draft to Columbus, who traded up to that pick just to select Tyler Peddle, which was a really beautiful little moment uh, being at the draft and, and seeing his entire family quite dejected that he hadn't been selected up until that point, jump up in, in pure excitement when his name was announced with the final pick of the draft was quite a beautiful moment. And I think he deserved to go in the top five or four rounds in the draft class. So that was a definitely a good, a good trade for uh, Columbus to make. And yeah, I think that that wraps up the steals. Uh, these are kind of the players that me and Hattie liked a lot more than, than what their draft slots would indicate their value being. And they are the players that we kind of want to plant our flags in and, 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 and see how they develop now with time. And, are, are really excited to to keep supporting as as the next years go by but that concludes this episode and the first week of the relaunch of the locked on Antel prospects podcast so i hope that you all enjoyed it and uh check us out um with all of our links they will be in the, descri in the description down below whether you're on youtube or on your typical podcast listening uh place and we will see you again on Monday morning with our next episode for the week. Until then, goodbye.